episode 142 of the podcast, using food isn't necessarily using positive reinforcement. And using positive reinforcement isn't necessarily using food. Now, if you've tried using food and it didn't work for you, it could be that you weren't using the tool correctly. Much like an owner brushing over mats or an owner giving a prescription diet but still giving junk food. Understanding the tool and how the process works is how you get the results that you're looking for. You're listening to the Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast. I'm Chrissy Newmeyer-Smith. I'm a certified professional groomer, a certified behavior consultant for canines, a certified professional dog trainer, and the owner of Happy Critters in Nashua, New Hampshire. And this, my friends and colleagues, is the podcast where grooming and training meet. When we talk about training, food can be a tool. It's not just about eating. It's not just about having something tasty. It's about having something available that a dog likes, something that a dog may want more of, something that a dog may notice going away, something that can lighten the mood when a dog is unsure. Now, being a tool, some dogs aren't very interested in food. Some dogs aren't interested in food when they're unsure or stressed, and some dogs are over-aroused by food and can't focus. By now, you might be thinking that food isn't an easy solution, and you're right, it's not. Food is a tool. It can be used as part of a solution for some dogs some of the time. Now, I'm going to start off with one of the most common mistakes that I see and (laughs) lead people to become frustrated. There are some really common mistakes, and I have done them all. So this one, it goes something like this. We tell an owner to bring in some special treats that will be only used in grooming. So let's say it's peanut butter or bacon, something super special that's only going to be used during grooming. Then we bring the dog to the grooming table and we just start doing the stuff and things that this dog stresses out about while trying to put special food in the dog's mouth. Does this sound familiar? Because I've been there. I've done this. I still see this being done. And the first few times that I ever tried using food to work on a grooming issue, I became frustrated. The dog was doing the same thing they always do. I was doing the same thing that I always do. And the food was either being ignored or snarfed up so quickly with no effect on the behavior at all. Not better, not worse, no effect. Just a frustrating situation for the dog and for me. And the only thing that did change was that using food made a mess and it added an extra step. So I was left feeling like this was a waste of time. Training with treats during grooming can't work. This is just a waste of time. Yep, that was me. (laughs) And I think that we've been there. I think everyone has tried using it that way. And what was going on is that I wasn't understanding the many ways that the tool can be used, that food is a tool. What I was doing was just trying to add food randomly, and that's not really going to be helpful. So when we start thinking about tools, then we start thinking about training and goals. So what is the goal? Before we grab a tool, what is our goal? And my goal, and usually, if you guys listen to the podcast, you guys know this, my goal is to help a dog be calm, comfortable, and cooperative. Now, to look at that goal... I also need to think about what where stage that dog is at. Is that dog already showing signs that they can be comfortable? Are they already calm? Are they not calm? And not calm is the entire problem. What is going on with that dog? And what is my goal, not just for that dog long term, but for this particular session? And then I can look at my tools, tools available to me and processes available to me to build something that we can then use and reevaluate. Because you have to reevaluate if a dog's behavior is changing in the direction that you want it to change. But when we just put down food, what I see a lot of is dogs that are getting really stressed out and we're just trying to add food and then we give up. All right? How many times have you heard a groomer say, I've tried food and that just doesn't work? You've heard groomers say things like, we've tried dogs on medication and it just doesn't work. For the same reason, the medication is a tool to be used as part of a process where we're helping the dogs be more comfortable with it. There's no magic pill. Wouldn't that be awesome? This is the he's good for grooming pill. (laughs) Or this is the he's good for grooming treat. We need to think about the process. 
The process is what's important because these are tools. They're tools. Now, to draw a parallel with that, if you want to think about tools, you can also think about the brush. So how many times do owners come in and say that they're brushing their dog, but they're brushing over the top of mats? That's an owner who maybe has the correct brush, but doesn't understand the process. And that's what we're doing when we're like, I don't know, I threw treats and we had treats available and I don't know, it just didn't work. Treats don't work. I would be like the owner saying brushing doesn't work. I don't understand. And then it could be that they have the wrong brush. Maybe a treat isn't the right tool for this dog. Dogs that aren't into treats, treats aren't going to be the right tool. When we're trying to use treats, what we're trying to do is use them as something that motivates a dog or can be used as a source of like, oh, there's something there that I want. Maybe it's a lure. Maybe it's a bribe. Maybe it's a negative punishment. Like, as soon as you are misbehaving, all the treats just went away. Like, oh, man, disappointment. That's negative punishment. Something removed that reduces behavior. So we can look at these tools and we can start thinking about what we need to do to change behavior. Another example, if you think about an owner who has the wrong brush, maybe they are line brushing, but they're trying to line brush a doodle with a bristle brush, with a boar bristle brush. That's not the right brush for that type of coat, even if their process was correct. So when we start thinking about things that are more obvious to our groomer eye, <laughs> and then putting it into training, like, oh, right. If they're not interested in the treat, then I can't use that as a reward. But that's okay, because there are lots of ways to use positive reinforcement, because positive reinforcement is something added that builds the behavior. So the behavior's there, you want to reward it, you want it to continue or increase, and you add something. And that could be something as simple as, like, yeah, buddy. How many dogs are like, oh, well, that's not so bad. You know, some dogs really like that. Other dogs do not. So look at the tool and how we can use food as a tool, how we can use goal setting in training, because otherwise we're just brushing over mats. Now, another example, not the same as brushing over mats, but another example is when um, an owner has a prescription diet. And they think, well, okay, I'm going to give him this special food. He's got itchy skin. Let's use itchy skin as an example. You know, vet says, maybe it's allergies where you're putting him on a special diet. And when I was a vet tech, I used to see this a lot. We'd talk him through the whole special diet thing. And then they would come into board and we'd realize, well, he's not getting good responses to this new diet because you guys are still giving him junk food. Like they come in with their snossages like, oh, but he's getting the prescription diet. It's a misunderstanding. It's not understanding the whole purpose of the diet, which by the way, if you guys don't know this one, prescription diets really are just, okay, we're gonna make sure that this diet has no chicken in it, for example. If we think that's something that your dog can't handle, when they come in to board, and these owners were totally like, what? But those aren't his food, those are his treats, because they just didn't understand. And sometimes you just needed to see what they were giving the dog and point out this bag, look, it says it has chicken in it. This one, look, it says it has chicken in it. And they're like, oh, okay. That they needed more guidance, more than what we had already given them. And that's where I find groomers are at. Groomers need more understanding of, we can't just say, bring in special food and traumatize your dog while we throw bacon on the table. That's not how this works. It may, for some dogs, be enough. So maybe some people cling to it thinking, well, you know, for this particular dog, I mean, that was enough for him to really relax a little bit with us. Because, you know, a treat party is a fun thing. But for the most part, it's not really how we use food as a tool in a training plan. So in the next part, we're going to talk a little bit more about some training, some things that we can use food for, and how we can figure out if the food is helpful or not. If you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes and tell all of your friends. I made a course for you. Would you like to become a Master Groomer Behavior Specialist? The course is through Whole Pet Grooming Academy. It will be online content and live video chats. Class sizes are going to be very small so that I can work with you individually and that we can learn a lot together. And the first class is starting in October. So contact me, Chrissy, at happycritters.net 
or contact the school, wholepetnh.com, to find out more. If we want to use treats as a tool, let's start off with, does this dog like food? Now, I know we're going to hear the answer, of course he likes food, but not necessarily, because I'll tell you what, my last dog, my last Border Collie, wasn't very interested in food. Now, she would take treats from somebody, but she'd usually spit it out, and I think she liked seeing if she could get people to give her stuff. So I'm going to add here that the issue of food motivation, which is what it's called, how food motivated is your dog, is hotly debated. And sometimes trainers get into big debates about it. Some say that if they aren't food motivated, it may be that they're being overfed and to try skipping a meal or two. I'm kind of worried about that. I don't want to start skipping meals for dogs, but I'm putting it out there for you to consider for an individual because sometimes we're working with dogs who are tremendously overweight and overfed. And we should rethink if food is a good tool for them, even if they are motivated by it. If a dog is super overweight, super overfed, <laughs> you know, think about it. Should we be using that? And actually, I think because we're part of the healthcare process for a lot of these dogs, we should also probably suggest that they talk with their vet about possible diet changes. Sometimes owners are a little reluctant for that, but we can talk to them about, well, maybe a different food would be better and maybe a different amount would be better. Maybe your dog's issue, because we see this a lot in grooming, is that this dog's joints are sore. So when we talk about our behavior problems, sometimes those big, heavy, overweight dogs, that overweight part is causing their joints to be sore, which is causing some of their behavior problems. So think about, does a dog like food? Okay, that's going to play into if we can use it as a tool. There are tools that we can't use for every dog. So back to my brushing example. <laughs> I'm not going to use a wide tooth comb on a short-haired chihuahua. Nothing wrong with a wide tooth comb, nothing wrong with a short-haired chihuahua, but those two are not going to meet. That, there's no point. That's not the right tool for that dog. So I want you to think about, is this dog motivated by food? And so when we talk about grooming purposes, I just really want to know if they enjoy treats enough to work for them. And the average owner is going to know that. The average owner is going to know if this dog is willing to do happy little tricks and stuff and get silly to get treats. That's all we need to know. So now that we know that, how can we use it? Well, now we need a plan because we can't just throw food. So imagine this is another place where people make a mistake. Imagine you're using food. You just have food out, all right? And you're like letting a dog lick off a spoon. This one happens a lot. So you're trying to work on something near their rear end that they usually get growly about and air snap and, you know, and someone's giving them a peanut butter spoon to lick off. Now, if this dog is still snapping at you and still growling and still trying to bite you, does it seem like kind of a mixed message to have him licking peanut butter? Let's just use some common sense for a minute. It's not making a difference in his behavior, but we could accidentally be rewarding it, be rewarding the very behavior that we don't want. Just by saying, and here's some peanut butter. Especially if we have an owner helping. Because what do owners do? What do owners do? And we do it all the time. We see owners do it. They tell their dog, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. And what they mean is this longer conversation of, I'm not doing this to be mean to you, my darling. We're not doing this because you're a bad dog. We're doing this because it needs to be done. But they're telling him he's good and they're letting him lick peanut butter while the dog is telling you, I'm going to attack you if you keep touching my butt think about it. This is why people feel like food doesn't work for training. This is why people feel like using treats on the grooming table backfires. Because sometimes we're just using that tool at the wrong time, in the wrong place, with the wrong procedure. So we need a goal. And what we need to think about is where is this dog calm, comfortable, and cooperative? At what point does this dog switch from calm, comfortable, and cooperative to maybe not calm, or maybe not comfortable, or maybe maybe calm and comfortable, but not being cooperative. Like, where does that switch? Because it's not where the groomer is having trouble getting something done. We need to kind of step back further and really watch for when does this dog show us that they're starting to get a little stressed, or they're starting to get a little anxious, or they're starting to get a little worried, or nervous, or aggressive. When did they flip their switch? Because... That's where we need to work. So if you're thinking right now, 
of a particular dog and you're like, God, he's all wound up before he even walks into the shop. Yeah, that's probably not a grooming problem. That's probably a training problem that needs to be worked on outside of the grooming process. So let me give you an example. If, uh, if you are really afraid of snakes and every time you went to your hairdresser, she has one draped over her shoulders, you're not afraid of hair cutting, but you might have that kind of response every time you walked into her hair salon because she's always walking around with her snake and then she puts it away, but it's over there staring at you. <laughs> this beady little eyes. <laughs> All right, I love snakes. But as an example, you would start to pair that with this very bad experience. And the hair cutting would be something you'd be like, oh, God, I have to go to the hair salon to get my hair done. I hope she doesn't have that darn snake out. Our dogs do the same thing. If they're afraid of car rides, if they're afraid of strangers, like a lot of training problems happen outside of grooming. Yet groomers are thinking about the grooming process and where they're having trouble getting something done. Sometimes we need to tell owners, you need to prepare him for this process. You know, if he has trouble in the car ride, let's talk to your vet about what can be done about that. Before we talk to a trainer, because I think some dogs get car sick, and that can be very medical. We can have the vet talk to them first. But think about where the dog is having trouble. Does this dog have trouble when you reach over them to reach for a foot? Because sometimes we're reaching around them, especially when you think about picking up back feet for nails. We're reaching over their body to lift up a back foot. Some dogs are really uncomfortable with that. And so that, of course, is going to become a problem as we continue to do it and try to trim their nails. So if we think about where did the dog start losing their calm, comfortable, and cooperative, and if it's reaching over them, then that is what we need to work on. I want a dog who lets me reach over them and take hold of their foot. So that's what our goal would be. And then we need to think about how can I reward this dog for being good? You know, when I start to reach over and the dog is good, now I could give a treat. Ooh. And then I have to assess, is this dog being good? Are they being increasingly good? Are they accepting more of this because I'm adding a treat? Because we always have to look how the behavior is changing. One repetition isn't enough to know. If I just reach over and he was good and I give him a cookie, we can't call that positive reinforcement yet because we don't know if the behavior is increasing, maintaining, staying the same. We don't know yet. We have to keep doing it. Do it a few more times and see. It's about behavior change. And if the behavior is maintaining, staying the same, or increasing the way that we want it to. So that's one way to use the food. If we have a dog who has food in front of them, and like they see that the food's on the counter, and when they're good, they get one. We can also use that to, if they start wiggling or becoming inappropriate, remove the food. Ooh, so now there's a behavior that we do not want that we're watching for. And as soon as the dog does something we do not want, we remove the food. That's negative punishment. It's similar to a teenager is giving you a hard time and you take away their phone. Ooh, yeah, suddenly you realize like, oh, negative punishment can be really, really harsh. <laughs> I'm not really into punishment. I'd rather use positive reinforcement, rather build the behavior that I do want. But I want you to know that's an option there, especially if... You become savvy enough to notice if a dog is being really good that you can use both. They're both available. You don't have to choose just one. If three repetitions and this dog is being really, really good and then the fourth one he starts wiggling and you're like, oh, and you pull a treat away or a toy away or you remove something, right? Like, ooh, wait a minute. The other thing got me good stuff. This thing I'm doing makes good stuff go away. It's a powerful message part of our toolbox. Think about it. That's something else we can do with food. Now, what if we have a dog who's just kind of nervous about people and kind of not into strangers or the loud noises or something? There's another process that we can do, which is something mild happens and treats happen second. So the mild thing, not full-blown, I turn on the high-velocity dryer on your head, but maybe just turn on some loud noise is a predictor of good things happen, which could be treats. So now it turns into, I hear the dryer turn on low, 
and then treats happen. Dryer turns on low, treats happen. Dryer turns on louder, treats happen. Are we still calm, comfortable, and cooperative? Great. So then we try dryer turns on even louder, treats happen. And that would be classical conditioning. So there are lots of ways that we can use food if we have a plan that could be positive reinforcement, that could be negative punishment, that could be classical conditioning. Three options that aren't necessarily the same and there are more options out there. But part of it is having a plan and watching for the change in behavior, but also not just blindly adding treats in hopes that a dog is going to decide on their own, oh, this seems nice, because that rarely ever happens. And it's one of the biggest mistakes I see in the grooming industry with anybody who says they don't like using treats, because they're just adding treats without a plan. If you'd like more information, you can find me at Chrissy at happycritters.net, um, happycrittersdogtraining.com, or you can join the Facebook group, Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast, or the Facebook page, Creating Great Grooming Dogs. I really look forward to hearing from you.